Good morning, good morning. Welcome, welcome to PTPOG, Practicing the Presence of God. Glad to have you back with us. This is Pastor Michael Hayes. I'm blessed to have you with me this morning along with us as we travel through the Word of God. What's going on, Mike? How you doing, man? Good to see you. Hey, Ellsworth. How you doing, man? Jerry, good morning to you. What's happening, man? <laughs> have a good, Hope you're having a good Tuesday. Can you believe it's Tuesday already? My wife and I were just remarking about just a minute ago about how quickly this thing, I mean, these days, these weeks, they just go by like, I mean, it's just crazy. It's just unbelievable. It's already August the 18th. I can't believe it. Kids are about to go back to school, either, you know, virtually or however they're going to do it. Uh, and for those of you who have kids, you know, you know, the problem, the issue with that uh, is such a big concern for those of us who are parents right now. Uh, pray for the parents, pray for us as parents and pray for our children. Uh, this is a serious situation. And, uh, you know, it's not an easy decision to make by any stretch of the imagination. So I would ask for prayer. Uh, on the behalf of all the parents and of all the young people, the kids, the children uh, that are seeking to go back to school in one capacity or another, uh, we really need your your prayers and your support in whatever decision uh, that it's going to be made. So that being said, I'm so glad to have you with us again. We're back together <clears throat> one more time to look at the Word of God. And today we have a very interesting passage coming to us from the Bible in Proverbs chapter 20 and verse number 25. If you have your Bible, you can turn with me there. Proverbs chapter 20 and verse number 25. The Bible says this, It is a snare to the man who devoureth that which is holy, and after vows to make inquiry. I'm going to read that from the English Standard Version, which is a different version of the Bible, but is a little bit more uh, explanatory, if you will. English Standard Version of Proverbs 20, verse 25 says this, it is a snare to say rashly, it is holy, and then to reflect only after making vows. Today, we're speaking from the subject, the quitter's trap, the quitter's trap. Let's bow our heads briefly for a word of prayer. Father, thank you for your grace and mercy and kindness and your love and kindness and just your blessings, Lord, are fresh and new every morning. We thank you, Lord, for another day with you. Be with us now, uh, Lord, as we enter into your word. We truthfully need your presence to come along with us and to guide us, lead us, Lord, and open our minds and hearts to what it is that the Spirit would speak to us today. Thank you, Lord, by your grace, we are saved. And Lord, please give us this day our daily bread in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Amen. Hey, Jerry, what, what's going on, man? The 
pray. Oh, really? Okay. Okay. I didn't, I just now saw that Jerry. I apologize, man. Uh, we're praying for you, man. Praying for you. Uh, uh, yeah, man. Uh, these, these health challenges, I tell you, I've been having this weird kind of cough lately, but I don't think it has anything to do with COVID. It's got something to do with, uh, with, uh, well, anyway, let's, let's move on. We're looking at Proverbs chapter 20, verse 25. And what an interesting text. Um, it's a snare for man to devour that which is holy and afterwards vow, after his vows, I should say, make inquiry or question, or make questioning, uh, make interrogatives into the matter. Uh, what does this mean? What does this mean? It says it's a snare or it is a trap for a man to devour that which is holy. Now the word devour is a Hebrew word which officially means on its very surface, on its, you know, by the very base nature of the definition of the word. It means <clears throat> uh, it is a snare for a man who rashly speaks out this is holy that's what that that's what that word means it means to rashly speak out or to rashly declare something to rashly say something just you know it means to rash to talk wildly maybe uh to uh you know just do without deep thought one might say um it so the image the other the secondary definition of this word is kind of like when you see something like for let, let's say for example you go over to somebody's house for dinner right and you're messing around in the kitchen you're looking around to see what they got oh and you see this plate this plate just laid out and it's filled with whatever the food is you don't even know what food it is but it looks so good, you just grab a snip of it and throw it in your mouth. It's to do something rashly. That, that's what it means. That's what it means. You're eating something, you're swallowing something, you don't even realize, oh, you're eating caterpillars. <laughs> you know. <laughs> now, obviously, nobody would do that, you would think. But the point is this, is to make uh, a rash decision specifically about something that has to do with God, <clears throat> to make a rash decision specifically with something that has to do with God, with that which is holy. That's why Proverbs 20, 25 in the English Standard Version says, it is a snare to say rashly, it is holy, and then to reflect only after making vows. So the issue is, as we have entitled this go live, the quitter's trap. Let me ask you a question. <clears throat> Are you a quitter? <clears throat> Are you a quitter? That's a very important question. What do you mean, Pastor? That, that, why are you asking me? That's that man, that, you kind of in my face with that. Well, yeah, I am in your face with that. <laughs> Are you a quitter? Are you a type of person that starts something and doesn't finish it. There are a lot of people like that. As a matter of fact, almost everybody has some portion of their life where they begin something, but they don't finish it. Do you make New Year's resolutions? And then later on decide, well, you know what? Mm, Might have bit off a little more than I really wanted to chew, right? Isn't that where that phrase comes from? You bit off more than you could actually chew? Are you a quitter? Do you re-examine things in the middle of making a commitment? Can I answer that for you? Can I answer that for you? All of us do. <laughs> Everybody's done that. I don't care who you are. I know a lot of people like to think, oh man, I don't quit. I love to listen. I always bring it. I always follow up with every commitment I make. I know we love to say that, but the truth of the matter is, the truth of the matter, if we're being honest, if we're being honest, if we're being real, all of us are human beings and you know and I know 
that we have done that. We have made a commitment in one place or another, and in the middle of said commitment, in the middle of that journey, we have decided, you know what? Mm, I think I'm going to go in another direction. Well, this text is talking about, this text is talking about doing that in the things of God. And so the first point I want to make here as I set this principle up today is this. Point number one is this. Write this down. The wise have learned to trust God with every decision in their life. The wise have learned to trust God with every decision in their life. So here's the point of this particular uh, first point that I'm making. Here, here, here is the principle. There is no ungodly commitment for the Christian. Mm. Mm. Uh -huh. Woo, boy, mercy. <laughs> what are you saying, Pastor? What are you saying? You know, we have this thing in our minds for some reason. I don't know necessarily where it comes from other than sin that we make we can make commitments that don't have anything to do with God. You know, that we can make commitments that don't have anything to do with heaven, that don't have anything to do with holiness or righteousness or anything, that you can make unholy commitments and it's okay. There is no such a thing for a Christian. Everything in your life is holy. You, you see I'm looking at you dead in your face when I said that? Everything that you do is holy. Everything in your life is holy. There's nothing about your life that isn't holy. There's nothing about your life that should not be committed to God. That is a secular attitude that says that, oh, well, this is what I'm doing over here. It has nothing to do with God. This has to do with me. And then this over here, this has everything to do with God and nothing to do with me. That's secular. That that is a Greek, a, a Greek <laughs> mythological, uh, you know, uh, 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 Europeanized foolishness that came from the Greeks, where we separate the holy from the unholy, so to speak. Or that that is not true in the case of a Christian. Everything you and I do must be, and is in fact committed to God, because everything you do relates to God. You are a godly person now. You are called by God. You are covered by God. You are being used by God. You are infused with his spirit. Somebody say amen. So everything you do is about God. Everything you do is about God. The, every program that you watch. Are y'all listening to me today? Every car that you choose to purchase. Every credit card that you pick up. I wish I had help in here today. Every bank account that you open. Hello, somebody. Every, everything you do, everything you do is in alignment with the will or outside of the will of God. Everything you do is holy. There's, there's no unholy stuff that I don't have to worry about God having to deal with in my life. No, 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 no. <laughs> This is why Proverbs chapter 3 and verses 5 through 10 say this. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not unto your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your path. Notice, in everything, in everything, not most things, not just the important things, in everything. That even means what you're about to eat after you get off this go live today. Amen. That needs to incorporate God in it. Come on, say amen. Yes, 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 yes. I know it's difficult. I know it's hard for us because for some reason we think that we can step outside of the view of God and then we can step back in to the view of God whenever we feel like it. We can walk outside of the way of God, and then we can jump back into walking in his ways. That's what we think. We actually believe that. I'm, I, I'm telling you, as I'm talking about Christians now. I'm not talking about in the world. I'm talking about Christians actually think that they can jump outside and do what they want to do and then come back and do what God says. No. 
No, 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 no. When you do, listen, when you and I make decisions, you are incorporating God in that decision. In other words, God, because his spirit lives in you, you are bringing God with you into the decision, whatever the decision is. That's why you and I must trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean to your own understanding. In all your ways, do what? Acknowledge him. What does that mean? That means recognize him first. That means call on him. That means ask him, Lord, should I drive this? Should I go this way? And some people are going to call you crazy. Well, why you, why you coming? He always seems like he's talking to God. That's right. I am always talking to God. Maybe that's how we should be. Maybe that's how we should live. Yes, I'm always checking to see what God has to say. Amen. It says, be not wise in your own eyes, verse 7 of chapter 3 of Proverbs. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. What is evil in the context of this particular chapter and verse? Evil is doing things in your own way and in your own power. Whew. Mercy. Verse eight, it shall be health to your navel and marrow to your bones. Honor the Lord with your substance and with your first fruits of all thine increase. So shall thy barns be filled with plenty and thy presses shall burst out with new wine. Now, a lot of people use this to talk about giving tithes and offerings. And, you know, you can you can incorporate that into that verse and into the uh, interpretation of that text. But it's not just talking about tithes and offerings. It's not just talking about your finances. It's talking about your everything. It's talking about everything that we do, every choice that we make. Every choice needs to be, need, listen, it needs to go by God first. So the wise individual, the wise Christian has learned to trust God with every decision in their life because they know that no commitment made by them is, you know, is ungodly or doesn't have God in it. You're bringing God in the decision when you make the decision because you've decided to take his name upon yourself. Are you all listening to me today? When people look at you, they're looking at God. When people look at your decisions, they're looking at God's decisions. Are y'all with me today? So watch this. Point number two is this, in terms of this proverb, the wise have learned about the commitment trap. The wise have learned the truth about the commitment trap. I forgot to write this out completely this morning. Y'all forgive me. Do you know, that's point number two, by the way, the wise have learned the truth about the commitment trap. Do you know about the commitment trap? Do you know about that? This is where hasty decisions are made and a failure to examine one's choices before we make them brings great shame to you and those connected to you. Too many of us as Christians, and I'm talking to myself as I'm talking to you, make hasty decisions based upon feelings and emotions, based upon, well, this is how I feel, and I just feel I need to have this done, and so on. So we haven't asked God. We haven't asked God about it at all. But yet we're bringing God into the decision. Whether we know it or not, we're bringing God into the decision. Because how your life goes God, excuse me, people are looking at you to see how does God treat his own people? Are you all listening to me today? And when they look and see, well, God doesn't treat his people. Look, look, look at him. Look at how embarrassing his life is. Look at the poor decisions that he has made. Obviously, God does not invoke any wisdom to, into his people's lives because look look at the, look at the pastor look at the elder look at the deacon look at the member look at this church member look at the the decisions that they have made you see notice with me in Luke chapter 14 what book did I say everybody Luke chapter 14 
and we're reading verses 27 through 33. Luke chapter 14, reading verses 27 through 33. Here's what the word of God says. And this is, by the way, our Lord Jesus is speaking. Watch what the word of God says. Luke chapter 14, verses 27 through 33 says this, and whosoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Wow, that's a very powerful statement. <laughs> what is a disciple? A disciple is a student, a follower, one who follows the example of someone else, of a teacher, of a great sage, if you will. And so Jesus is saying, if you are going to be my student, if you are going to be my follower, if you're going to be my pupil and I'm going to be your mentor, you're going to have to bear a cross. So let's look and see what, how Jesus kind of describes this idea of a, of a cross, at least in this particular passage. Notice verse 28. He says, for which of you intending to build a tower doesn't sit down first and count the cost, whether he have sufficient enough to finish it? lest happily after he has the, laid the foundation and is not able to finish it, and all that behold it begin to mock him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. I remember when I was living uh, in Ohio, I was pastoring in Ohio a few years ago, and where we were living, we were living in this nice house, uh, and up the street from this house, by it, on the other side of the closest Walmart to us, which was about four miles away, by the way, because we lived a little bit out in the country a little bit. But anyway, I digress. So next to the Walmart, there was this whole new uh, condominium subdivision that was being developed. And I'm telling you, it was, uh, you should have seen it. They had the signs up. Oh, and it was right next to this new Walmart that had been built. It was a relatively new Walmart out on the outskirts of town. And a lot of people were going and flocking to it. So I guess the developers decided, hey, this would be a great place to put some new condos, right? Because it's right next to the Walmart and it's a shopping center here. And obviously people want to live near where they can go shopping. And so they began to build and they put down, watch this, they put down the foundations of all these new condominiums that they were going to build. And do you know, do you know that that's as far as they got? I kid you not. That is as far as they got. They laid all the foundations for all of these brand new condominiums that were going to be really beautiful, nice, uh, relatively affordable. I mean, just beautiful in, in terms of the picture that they had and the schematic that they had put up for everybody to see these new condos from, you know, uh, 250000 or whatever it was. I can't remember the price. But anyway, the point being this, for year after year, ladies and gentlemen, my wife and I used to go to the Walmart and we would pass by that so-called new subdivision ever, right on the side of the Walmart. Nothing but grass and uh, 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 roots and and uh, 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 weeds were growing through the cracks in the foundations that they had laid because they did not, for whatever reason is, have enough to finish what they had started. The developer decided this isn't something that I really am able to do. For whatever the reason is, either he didn't want to do it or he was unable to finish it. And because of that reason, ladies and gentlemen, there's an open field with a few plots of foundation with cracks in it, weeds growing, grass growing, higher and taller than almost you and me, right next to the Walmart. Isn't that something? And I said to myself, wow, that text has now come alive to me. <laughs> Luke chapter 14, verse 27 through 30, it's come, it's come alive to me. This verse 30 says, saying this man began to build and he wasn't able to finish. Wow. Notice verse 31. Or what king going to make war with another king would sit down, would not sit down first and consult whether he's able with just 10,000 to meet him that's coming against him with 20,000. 
or else while the other is yet a great way off, he sending an embassage or an embassy, if you will, or an ambassador and desires conditions of peace. So likewise, whoso he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. Now, this is a very powerful text and it's making a very powerful point that you may not be getting, but I'm gonna try to make it clear in terms of how this reflects on our anchor text this morning, Proverbs chapter 20 and verse 25. You see, ladies and gentlemen, watch this. The issue here is how you made the commitment that you're making. This is very, very important what I'm about to say. The issue here is making a commitment without really recognizing the impact of the commitment and that you're making. And starting in making the commitment one way, but in the middle of said commitment, changing and turning it into something else. What do you mean? What do you mean, Pastor? Here's what I mean. Proverbs 20, verse 25, English Standard Version. It's a snare to say rashly, it's holy, and then reflect only afterwards making, and reflect only after making the vow. What does that mean? Or ask questions after making the vow. What does that mean? It means that there are people, watch this, who start out making commitment with God but in the middle of said commitment, they turn the commitment from being a God commitment to a ordinary, regular man-made commitment. And therefore, since it's a man commitment, I don't really have to be committed to it. I can choose to do it or I can choose not to do it. But here's what you forgot. You forgot that God was involved in this commitment. <laughs> You forgot that you brought God into, you said this thing was holy. You said this thing was something of God. You recognize God was in this thing. And now in the middle of it, you're deciding, oh, that was just a, a rash decision that I made. No, it wasn't. Now I'm about to move on because I don't want to break too far. Here's the last point I want to make. Or the next point I want to make is this. The wise, write this down. The wise have learned that you have to start and end your commitment with Jesus. You have to start and end your commitments with Jesus. Watch this, watch this, watch this. Galatians chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. Galatians chapter 3, verses 1 through 3 says this, O oh, foolish Galatians, who's who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ have been evidently set forth, crucified among you? This only would I learn of you. Did you receive the spirit by the works of the law or by the learning or hearing of faith? Are you so foolish having begun in the spirit? Are you now made perfect by the flesh? Isn't that a powerful text? What is that text talking about? This is Paul talking to the Galatians who have lost sight of what the gospel is really all about in terms of salvation. And they have unfortunately listened to some false teachers who have come in and told them, listen, <laughs> You're not saved by grace. You're not saved by your faith. You're saved by doing what you're supposed to do. You got to do good works so that you can prove yourself to God that you are holy, righteous, and worthy of being saved. And Paul comes in and says, listen, man, <laughs> didn't you not start with faith in God? If you started with faith in God, if you started with the spirit of God, you've got to end with the spirit of God. Come on, say amen. If God is the one who made you and put you on the righteous path, then God is the one who's going to take you and keep you on the righteous path. 
Somebody say amen. You can't switch in the middle of the journey and say, oh, well, God had the reins initially, but now I'm going to take the reins and I'm going to run this thing by myself. Oh, and by the way, you know what? I took the reins and, oh, I found out I couldn't do it. Well, I guess I won't do it anymore. You see, here's the point. Here's the point I'm trying to make, and I hope that this is clear. When you make, watch this. Let me put it this way. Let me, let me make it clear. There are people who make decisions for Christ. <laughs> oh, oh, help me. There are so many people who have come to church and they've given their lives to Christ. They've made commitment to Christ. They've given their lives over to the Lord. And after a while, they get tired or they get bored or they get lost or they, you know, they just lose a sense of whatever it is. And they start trying to do things on their own and they realize it's too hard and they leave the church. It's too difficult, so they leave the church. Or they leave this church and they go to another church because they think that this is the, this church, this, this is what's messing me up. This is why I'm not spiritually strong. It's because of this church. So let me go to this other church. And they go to this other church and the other church Eventually, at first it starts out, it sounds, it feels pretty good. People are accepting and so forth. And then the next thing you know, oh man, this church is just like the old church. Let me leave this church. And then they go to another church. And what happens is they started out with God, committing themselves to God and asking God to keep them and bring them through. But then they started relying on themselves to get themselves through. They started making their own choices and their own decisions. They refused to listen to God. Are you all listening to me today? Are you all listening to me today? This happens almost every day for Christians. They sit up here and they make a commitment to God. They heard the preacher preach. They know it was God that spoke to them. They know it was God. It was definitely God. And they gave their life to Jesus. And then afterwards, instead of following Jesus, instead of keeping their lives in alignment with God, instead of praying to God and constantly submitting themselves and their lives to God on a daily basis, they move away from doing that, and now they start trying to live life on their own again. They go backwards instead of forwards, and they refuse to commit their full decision-making over to God, and then they say, oh, the problem is the church. Oh, the problem is the preacher. Oh, the problem is the elder. Oh, the problem is the deacon. Oh, the problem is the members in the church. No, the problem is you. You are the problem because you're trying to finish out this race on your own power. You're the problem. And now you want to quit. You made a holy decision. That means you gave it over to God to bring you into the fullness of his holiness, his righteousness, and his salvation. Continue to commit your decisions to God. Stop trying to figure it out for yourself. In the middle of the journey with God, all of a sudden now you're questioning, should I take the reins now, God? Is it time for me to take the reins now? No, it's not time for you to take the reins. No, you ain't never going to get the reins. You know why? Because you don't know enough. You're not smart enough. You're not good enough. You don't have enough to finish the race inside of yourself. It's God that finishes the race for you. Having started in the spirit, why would you glean over to the flesh? That doesn't even make any sense. But this is what people do all the time. They do it all the time. I see it over and over again in the church, over and over again. They start in the spirit. Oh, God's spirit moved in my life. Oh, I heard his voice. Oh, I heard. And then suddenly they don't hear his voice anymore. You know why? Because you didn't stay connected. Because you were too busy trying to live life on your own and trying to work it out by yourself and trying to do it by works instead of by faith. I see this over and over again. And so many people are quitting the church, are quitting on God because they haven't let God do what's supposed to be done. It's God's work, not your work. It's God's work. Stop quitting on God. You've got yourself involved in a quitter's trap. 
You started out with God, and then all of a sudden you did a switcheroo, and now you think you're God. Mm, mm, mm. Don't get me started. Don't get me started on this. I'll tell you, I could preach on this all day. I see it so many times, so many times. I have seen so many people leave the church, leave, walk away from God, walk away from the church. Oh, it's this. Oh, they got every complaint, every murmur. That's because you're not keeping your eyes on Jesus. Let me take you to the next text. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Let me take you to the text because I know somebody needs it. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2 says this. Therefore, since we are surrounded with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us therefore lay aside every weight that which so easily clings to us and so closely besets us, and then let us run with endurance, with endurance, that is, here's what endurance means. Endurance means with the intention to finish. That's what endurance means. I wish I had help in here today. When you run this race with God, when you decide I'm gonna walk with God, I'm gonna become a disciple of God, I'm going to be saved by the power of God. Thank you, God, for saving me. Thank you, God, for living in me. Thank you, God, for setting me free from sin. When you start that journey, listen, you're walking that journey with the intention of finishing it. That's what endurance is. Endurance is I'm going to finish it. I don't care what it takes. I don't care what it takes. I'm going to finish it. I don't care. I'm not leaving the church. I don't care what anybody says. I'm not leaving God. I don't care what anybody says. No, no, no. I decided that it was God who spoke to me. I decided that it was God who saved me. And I'm deciding that I will never quit on the Lord because he ain't never quit on me. I will not succumb to the quitter's trap. I will not succumb to the quitter's snare. No, I will not. I'm not quitting on the Lord. Come on, say amen. Come on, say amen. The reason why we quit is because we start doing things on our own power and we realize that we don't have enough to finish the race. We realize we don't have enough resources to finish building this tower. We realize that we don't have enough kinsmen to fight this fight against the devil and all his imps. We don't have enough. Well, guess what? You figured that out when you started out, didn't you? Didn't you realize that when you came to the cross, when you bowed down in front of the church and said, Lord, I surrender all. Didn't you realize that you didn't have enough, that it was God who was going to have to do it? Didn't you realize that? Stop acting like a fool and thinking and believing that you have got to finish it. You can't finish anything anyhow. You better go to God. You better go to the Lord. You better ask the Lord for his power, his strength, his encouragement, his endurance, his perseverance, his patience. Somebody say amen. So sick and tired of these wimpy, mamby-pamby Christians that don't want to finish out nothing because they're too busy worrying about whether or not they can handle it. You can't handle it. We all know that. That's why you started the race, because you knew you couldn't handle it. <laughs> Lord have mercy. Don't even get me started. Y'all going to get me. Mm, let me. Let me move on, man. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily besets us and let us run with endurance the race that's set before us. Notice, notice with me, verse two, powerful verse, pivotal verse. Looking to Jesus. Looking to who? Looking to who? Looking to Jesus, the founder and the perfecter of our faith. One, one version says, the, the, the beginner and the finisher of our faith. You got to look to Jesus. Stop looking at yourself. Stop waiting on yourself. Stop looking at your personal resources, your personal abilities, your personal talents, and your personal desires. Don't nobody care nothing about that foolishness. Ladies and gentlemen, it's time for you to lay aside every weight. What is the weight that we need to lay aside? Is it our sins? No, no, it's you. You need to lay aside yourself. You're the one dragging yourself through the mud and through the muck and mire of this race, and you can't handle the weight. Put yourself down. 
Submit yourself therefore unto the Lord and the mighty hand of God and watch him raise you in his due time. You are the weight. It's not your sins, it's you. <laughs> Woo! Don't get me started. Y'all ain't ready for this today. Looking ever to Jesus, who is the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, what did he do? He endured the cross. He despised the shame and he is seated right now at the right hand of the throne of God. You know why you have to look to Jesus? Because Jesus has already finished the race. You know why you need to look to Jesus? Because you need to look to Jesus because he's the one that began it and he's the one that's going to finish it. Why do I need to look to Jesus? Because he's the one that's ran the race and he knows everything about it. He's already been done with it. Somebody say amen. Why would you listen to somebody who hadn't even ran the race yet and finished it? Namely yourself. You can't listen to you. How do you know which way to go? How do you know which way to turn? Have you finished the race? Are you in heaven right now, sitting at the right hand of the Father? No. So why are you listening to yourself? You are a fool if you do that. You don't know nothing about nothing. You need to shut up, sit down, be quiet, humble yourself, and look ever forward to Jesus, who already finished the race, who already knows where the end is. Come on, say amen. It is already prophesied that your salvation is full and free and freely given and has declared you to be a son and daughter of God. You need to follow him. You need to listen to his voice. Come on, say amen out here. But here's the problem. Here's the problem. We got too many people that are succumbing to the quitter's trap. What's the quitter's trap? The quitter's trap is the old switcheroo. It's starting with God and ending with myself. That's the quitter's trap. You can't do that. You can't do that. And ladies and gentlemen, I'm be honest with you. I'm gonna be honest with you. I'm gonna be very honest with you on this go live right now. There are some old Adventist theologians who used to preach this foolishness that you gotta start with God, but it gotta end up on your own personal your own personal righteousness, okay? And you have to, you know, God's gonna judge you and your particular uh, 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 life actions and it's all about you. And if you aren't acting right, if you aren't doing right, God is gonna destroy you. Why would, why would you listen to that foolishness? Listen, you started with Jesus. Why are you trying to end with yourself? Are you crazy? You, you made the commitment with God in mind. The reason why you made the commitment is because you knew that God had your back. So why in the world would all of a sudden you cancel God out of the contract and now you're going to finish it out by yourself? That's the quitter's trap. That's the quitter's trap. You about to quit because you know you don't have enough to finish this thing out. Any fool can see that. <laughs> oh lord help me jesus perseverance ladies and gentlemen for the christian is a way of life there is no such thing as quitting going back turning around giving up letting uh, letting go of the plow if you will and going back to the old way of life trying to do things on my own in my own power no 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 uh-uh, not for the Christian. Notice with me, Luke chapter nine, verse 62 says this, Jesus said unto him, no man, no woman, having started putting his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Perseverance, you gotta keep on pressing with Jesus. Somebody say, amen. You can't quit. You can't quit on God because God doesn't quit on you. You can't quit on God. Come on, say amen. Christians are not quitters. You can't be a Christian and be a quitter. It's not possible. 
That's why Jesus said, if you don't bear your cross, if you if you start walking with this cross and then all of a sudden say it's too heavy and throw it down and go to your back the other way, you, you ain't no creep. You can't follow me. You've got to be willing to submit and allow God to help carry you through this walk with him. Ladies and gentlemen, the kingdom of heaven is for finishers, not quitters. I'm going to say it again. The kingdom of heaven is for finishers, not quitters. Somebody say amen. And ladies and gentlemen, here's the point. Watch this. It's not about, it's not about. <laughs> it's about finishing how you started. See, that's the test. The test is, are you going to finish like how you started? Are you going to finish trusting with God like you did when you first started trusting with God? Or are you now doing something else? That's the issue. The issue is endurance. The issue is perseverance. The issue is finishing how you started. That's the issue. It has nothing to do with an accumulation of works to be able to say, look at all the good stuff I did. Can you let me in, God? No, it has nothing to do with that. That has nothing to do with salvation. It is all about, did you finish how you start? Matthew chapter 10, verse 22. Notice with me. Matthew chapter 10, verse 22. And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he that endures to the end shall be saved. Did you see that? Did you see that? The one who finishes with the intention of getting to the finish line. Come on, say man out there. The one who doesn't quit. It doesn't say the one who doesn't quit and has all the awards in his hand and all the ribbons on his neck. It doesn't say anything about ribbons or awards. It doesn't say anything about all these wonderful works that you did. It says the one who finishes, the one who doesn't quit. That's the only thing that matters. It's the only thing that matters. Notice with me, James chapter 1, verse 12. I want you to see this. Ladies and gentlemen, you're going to see this text in a whole new light today. Watch this. James chapter 1 and verse 12. I want you to get this. I want you to get this. This is a powerful text today. James chapter 1 and verse 12. Notice with me. Blessed is the man or woman that endures temptation. For when he is tried, for when she is tried, she shall receive the crown of life. He shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord promised to them that love him. Notice, you didn't win it, but it was promised to you. It's a gift. Are you all listening to me today? And I want you to see this. James chapter 1, verse 12, same text. Watch this. Blessed is the man that endures what? That endures what? That endures temptation. Watch this. Hear me. Hear me. Hear me. Holy Ghost, preach this. Hear me, there is not one point in life and any point in this life where you're suddenly not going to be tempted. There's not one point in this life, <laughs> in this life, where suddenly I'm no longer tempted. I've reached this pinnacle of reality. I have reached perfectionism and now nothing tempts me. That is not a reality of Christianity. Are you all listening to me today? The text says, blessed is the one who continues to endure through temptation, who keeps pressing forward even though they're being tempted. Then it says, when you've been tried, when you've been tested, God approves you when you never give up, even though you're being tempted, even though you're being tempted and tested, even though you failed, even though you've dropped the ball, even though you've tripped up on your own t tongue and your own, are y'all listening to me? Even, but you get back up. A good man, a just man falls seven times, but he gets up again. If you keep getting back up, if you keep get, I don't care how many times you fail. I don't care how many times you fail. I don't care. I don't care how many times you fail. It doesn't matter. 
Doesn't matter. What matters is, are you getting back up and trusting God again? That's the only thing that matters. Failure is of no consequence. Failure is a part of life. It is a reality. All of us fail. Everybody fails. Come on, say amen. Everybody fails. The test, though, is not whether or not you fall. The test is, did you get back up? Did you keep going? It's endurance. That's the test. That is the test. I wish I had help in here today. I ain't giving up. I don't care what nobody say. I'm not giving up on God. I'm not giving up. I don't care how many times I fail. I don't care how many times I fall. I don't care how many times I'm tempted. I'm not giving up on God. I'm not declaring God's not good enough. God can't bless me. God can't set me free. I'm not declaring that foolishness. That's a lie. That is a fool's lie from the devil and from hell. I will not quit on God. I don't care how many times the devil causes me to fall. I don't care. I'm not quitting on God. Come on, say amen. I'm not quitting on God. I'm not quitting on God's people. I don't care how many times God's people fail, how many times God's people fall. God never quit on his people. God never quits. He never quits. Keeps running after you with your sorry tale self. Lord have mercy. Don't even get me started. Y'all going to have me preaching up in here. It's about endurance. It's about not quitting. It's about perseverance. It's about stopping and waiting and st stop acting like I don't, uh, 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 I don't have another. Stop crying. Stop your moaning. Shut up. Shut up and sit down and listen to the word of God. Stop your moaning. Stop your weeping and crying. Get on up in here and get with God. Let the Lord turn your life and change you around and pull you closer to him. Somebody say amen out here. Give me patience and endurance. That's what I need. I need endurance. Yes, I'm going to be tested. Yes, I'm going to be tried. Yes, I'm going to be persecuted. That's part and parcel of the walk with God. That's just the way it is. That's just the way it is. Come on, say amen. But guess what? It won't always be this way. Somebody say, hallelujah, it's not always going to be this way. Because if I keep pressing, if I keep pushing towards God, if I keep looking to him in order to live, looking ever to Jesus, who's the author and the finisher of my faith, here's what's going to happen. Revelation chapter 3, verse 21 says this, to him that overcomes. <laughs> in other words, to him that finishes the race. <laughs> hey, I'm going to grant them to sit with me in my throne. Notice, not on my throne, not next to my throne, in my throne, he said. And even as I also overcame and sat down with my father in his throne. <sighs> now, ladies and gentlemen, I wish I had time to really really interpret that text. I don't have time though. Revelation 21 and verse 7 says this, he that overcomes, to him that overcomes, they shall inherit all things. Notice, 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 I want you to see this. Hear me, hear me. I want you to see this because this is so gospel oriented. It says to the one who overcomes, to the one who does not quit, they're going to do what? They're going to earn all things. Is that what it says? No. It says they're going to inherit. In other words, it's going to be given to you. It's not what you earned. It's what you get by being a son and daughter of the king. <laughs> Woo! It says... They will inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. Woo! Hey, hey! He said, my sons and my daughters are the ones who don't quit, are the ones who don't fall for the quitter's trap. Come on, say amen. Are you falling for the quitter's trap this morning? Don't you fall for the quitter's trap. Don't fall for it. Don't fall for that foolishness. That's a lie from the devil, from hell. That's a lie from hell. Are you listening to me today? Don't you listen to that fool. He's a fool. You know why he's a fool? Because he's slew-footed. He's a liar. And he quit. He quit. 
He is a quitter. That's why he's trying to get you to quit. Have you ever noticed that people who quit always trying to get you to quit? Have you ever noticed that? You ever notice that? I never forget when I was in school and when I was, you know, I was joining the basketball team and there were guys on the team and they couldn't get it. They didn't like the coach or they didn't like the players or whatever the case, and they quit. And then they try to get me to quit. I'm not quitting. I, I came here. I didn't come here for you. <laughs> come on, say man. I didn't join the team for you. I joined the team for me. Come on, say man out here. Quitter is always trying to get other folks to quit. And that's exactly how the devil is. He's trying to get you to quit because he quit with his sorry, slew-footed self. Sorry tail self. Quitting on God. Idiot. He's a fool. And that's why he's going to hell because that's where all fools are going. I'm not going to be a fool with him. Come on, say amen. I will not be a fool today. Amen. I'm not going to fall for the quitter's trap. Amen? Amen. Let's bow our heads. Father God, thank you for your grace and mercy. Thank you for your kindness and love. Lord, thank you for this word today. I pray that it's been a blessing to someone uh, in a special way. I ask, Lord, that you would give us the spirit of endurance, the spirit of perseverance, the spirit of never quitting, the spirit, Lord, of stick to the spirit of pressing on anyhow, come what may, Give us that spirit, oh God. Don't let us quit on you because you never, ever, 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 ever quit on us. Thank you, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Listen, if this has been a blessing to you, please, please share it and like it and share it on your page on Facebook. And thank you so much for it. If you're watching this by way of YouTube on our YouTube channel, God bless you. Thank you for watching. And please, please leave a comment down below. I will respond to every comment. I love to hear from you. And also, if you're watching this by way of YouTube, please consider subscribing. We put up new videos every single day. God bless you. I love you with the love of the Lord. Take care and listen. <laughs> Always remember, don't ever forget. P, 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 O, G. Practice the presence of God in your daily life. I promise you, God promises you, he will make you be a person of endurance. He'll make you a finisher. He'll make you a winner because that's what he does. And he never loses. Come on, say amen. Because he's God all by himself. And he doesn't need anybody else. Praise the Lord. God be with you. God take care of you. We'll see you tomorrow. God bless. Bye-bye.